We haven't got time. <laughs> That's right. There's no hope, brother. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, I, uh, brother, brother Don and I did talk about it a little bit after it was over. I also spoke with a number of uh, pastors that I knew up there after it was over, and I believe, I don't think I'd be wrong about this, I believe that there were a great number of people that left that meeting with a, a sense of being somewhat overwhelmed because um, the predicament we're in in this country when it comes to the legal issues is so complex that the only way that you have a hope of surviving is to have the understanding of a constitutional lawyer and be surrounded by about maybe 10 secretaries that really understand paralegal language and uh, can sort of help keep you on course to remind you of what you need to be doing that day. And it would also help to be rich. So if you had those three things, you might make it. Um, <laughs> Um, the truth is the judicial system and the prospect of being sued, which is the real issue, which, by the way, the lawyers feed upon. I mean, this is not a problem for the lawyer. They like it that way because that's how they make their riches. But we're living in a society where uh, everybody is the blame for what happens. And when you live in a society where that's the way it is, then uh, innocence goes out the window. Uh, the whole society becomes public, uh, becomes uh, uh, guilty. And uh, by the way, that's a product of, of biological evolutionism which essentially says that we are a product of our environment. So if we're a product of our environment, then we're not the blame for the way we are. The environments, the things that are in our environment are the ultimate reasons why we're the way we are. So penalize them, do not penalize us. Um, so you get all kinds of things going on, like for instance, uh, one of the classic things that's been a frustration to people um, is like the man who goes into the bar room and he gets drunk. He goes out, gets in his car, drives down the road, runs over and kills somebody. Uh, whose fault is it? Well, the way the courts view it, the bartender is at fault. And so the one that's penalized is the man who gave the person the alcohol to drink, not the person that actually drank the alcohol, got in the car, drove, and killed somebody. Um, the same thing is true when it comes to uh, schools, uh, uh, people coming onto your property. If somebody falls down in your yard, um, then you're at fault. Uh, if there was a little dip in your yard, you should have filled up the dip. Uh, we no longer live in a world where things just happen, and it's unfortunate that it does. Somebody has to be blamed, and somebody has to pay. And so the court doesn't view falling down in somebody's yard as being their fault, that they should have been watching where they were going. They view it as the fault of the owner of the property. And so we're living in a world that is becoming increasingly that way. So no matter what you do, you're always at fault. The innocent are at fault. Uh, 
but anyway, I I don't mean to get off on that. Like I said, we could I, I could I could talk about this quite a while, but um, it's a frustration, uh, folks. The only hope that we have for the continuance of this ministry is not the lawyers; it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if our dependence is not upon Him to keep us safe from harm, then we're without hope. Uh, there's no way that we can safeguard ourselves from all the threats that there are around us. We've been here for 30, uh, uh, six, 38 years or so, uh, um, and we could have been closed down years ago. Why weren't we? There is no explanation but the fact that the Lord uh, has blessed this work and if we stay open in the future or if we get shut down and our property is sold uh, then we're going to have to we're going to have to believe that God is sovereign and he has allowed it to happen for reasons of his own and there's no other way that I know how to think about it and keep a sane mind uh, so uh, we, we live in jeopardy of losing millions of dollars worth of property here. Th this, this property is worth millions that we're on right now. There are movements in this country right now to make it possible for uh, some business, uh, ambitious businessman to come along and say, you know, we could really, we could really make a... A, a tremendous profit and improvement for the community if somehow or other we could get the property that belongs to Calvary Memorial Church. And so there uh, are things going on right now in the courts where things are getting shifted around from the way it's traditionally been. Um, and the the idea of eminent domain and the powers of the community that what is good for the people as a whole, this kind of thing that it has priority over you know individual ownership and and personal rights, property rights, or whatever and this this is all getting shifted uh, away from individual rights and what is good for the many and um it is very possible for uh, some big business operation to come into this town and say, you know, this would really make a great development prospect here. And in the, in the legal system, the way it is right now, we are very vulnerable to that kind of thing happening. Uh, it has happened already. Uh, what was the state that that, that happened? Where? where yeah, Vermont, Connecticut, somewhere up in there. That has already happened. So, you know, these are things that we've got to look into. And by the way, it's one of the things that Return America is going to be looking into and trying to stay on top of. So, um, anyway, our hope is in the Lord. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We're, we're studying Luke chapter 23, and I want to tell you this right up front. There are two views of Scripture, two ways that people can read Scripture. You can, you can read Luke chapter 23 and um, jot down the historical events as they occur in the 23rd chapter. And you would have what you might call the historical record of events as they occurred. Well, if that's all you know when you read through the Bible as a whole, the historical record of the things that occurred, uh, if you're talking about the events that took place in the Old Testament, whether it's David killing Goliath uh, or Samson, you know, walking off with the gates of the city, um, you know, or the many things that are recorded back there. All you have at the end of your study is is a <coughs> is a recollection of historical events as they occurred, 
And that's about all you have. The other way of reading Scripture is that of trying to discern what those events mean. What, what do they mean? Now, I know that um, I move through these passages very slow. I'm aware of that. Uh, we've been now in Luke 23 for some time. I don't know how long. It's been quite a while. 2001. It's 2001. Is that really? Uh, anyway, we've been in Luke's gospel that, that long. I didn't know that we had been in Luke chapter 23 that long. Uh, but uh, but what, I, what I'm trying to do here is uh, is help us... Uh, get more out of uh, Luke's gospel than the historical record of events that occurred. Folks, you really don't have anything if that's all you have. You've got to understand what's going on here. You've got to understand that God in his wisdom has impacted every statement with incredible spiritual meaning. And that's what we're after. We're, we're trying to think God's thoughts after him. We're trying to discern what, what is the nature of the problem. What is the message to us? There's a personal message in these chapters and in these verses. There's a lesson for us in the behavior of all of these people and their responses to the Lord Jesus. And, of course, his crucifixion. There are reasons for his dying on the cross. It's far more than just a historical event. There are reasons, uh, the depth of which we could study forever, literally. And we'll be studying forever, literally. Uh, last week, we were looking at, at verse 34, where the Lord said, Father, forgive them. And we discovered that this was not just a blanket forgiveness to the people who were crucifying him as though, uh, you know, the death of the Lord Jesus resulted in the salvation of the whole world. That is not what the message of the Bible is. There are those that uh, are saved and there are those that are lost. They're not predestinated that way. We have learned this. They're not predestinated before the foundation of the world to either be saved or to be lost. That is absolutely not what the Bible teaches. I can't think of anything that so mars the integrity of God as that doctrine. And I know a lot of people listen to these tapes and, uh, I, you know, uh, they go out and a lot of people around about the country and the world even hear some of these things that are being said I'm not going to be sensitive about the, the multitudes out there that may get offended by some of these thoughts. Um, I'm as fearful of being wrong, uh, hopefully, as, as anyone who uh, understands the value of their own soul. I don't want to be wrong, folks, about the message of this book. I mean, when I die and I leave this world, uh, I have to go with what I understand and what I believe to be true for me. The democratic majority is irrelevant when it comes to truth. The only thing that matters in the final analysis is how does God think? That's the only thing that matters. How does God judge? How does he define things? That's all that matters. Our responsibility is to come to the book and discover the mind of God and uh, understand it in such a way that we can enter into what is called the doctrine of eternal security. Folks, eternal security is not based upon the private interpretation of man. When yourself is the foundation of your understanding, there is always the element of doubt. Now, get this. When the foundation of your understanding is yourself, the powers of human reason alone, there is always the element of doubt. In other words, you could be wrong. We experience that all the time in the course of life. 
we think that we really understand a subject, but because of intervening variables that were not available to us at the time that we came up with that conclusion, we made a wrong conclusion. But because of the introduction of the intervening variables, we've been enlightened a little better about the, the subject, and we change our conclusion to what we think then is a right conclusion. The truth is the finite mind cannot know ultimate truth. And the reason is because the variables are infinite. Now, I'm not trying to be complicated about this, but I want you to get this point because the point is really pretty simple. The doctrine of eternal security is based upon the mind that knows all things where there are no possible intervening variables. God is the only one in the universe who can exhaust all the possibilities to all the questions. He's the only one that can give absolute conclusions to every question and it be absolutely right. And the reason is because he has the infinite mind that can exhaust all the reasoning in the universe. And so when he makes a declaration, it's absolute truth. Now, the doctrine of eternal security is based upon that. It's not based upon how much faith we have in God. It's based upon the faith that God has in himself. Big difference. The question is, can we know the faith that God has in himself? And the answer is, yes, we can. The question is, how? The answer is by the revealed word of God that is inspired and preserved by God. Can we know the mind of God? Can we know eternal truth? And the message is yes we can because the eternal infinite mind of God has revealed truth in his eternal word and we've got it. Now when we read the Bible we do not privately interpret it. We understand up front that God is the master of language he knows how to say what he means, and he means what he says. And our responsibility is to discern the written word of God and enter into the truth that he has revealed. My eternal soul rests in eternal security, not because of the faith that I have toward God, but my faith in the faith that God has in himself to do what he said he would do. That's the basis of eternal security. The faith that I have in the faith of God to do what he says he can do. Well, what did he say he could do? Well, he said that he could uh, take away my sin. He said he could do that. He said that he could raise me from the dead. He said that he would give to me eternal life. He said that he could do those things. Now, my confidence in that is based exclusively in the integrity that God has in himself to do what he said he would do if my faith and hope is entirely in him. Can you not see the difference between trying to muster up the faith from the standpoint of my own human reason to believe God versus just believing God? Entering into the faith that he has in himself to do what he says he will do. There is a difference, folks. Um, I heard an illustration one time of a a man who was walking a, a, a tight wire across the uh, Niagara Falls. And, uh, of course, the man doing that, um, you know, had tremendous confidence in himself that he could do that. And he came back and he asked the crowd if anyone wanted to get on his shoulders and go across with him. And, of course, a number of people turned him down and didn't want to do it because they didn't have faith. Uh, you know, there was the element of doubt. Well, what if he falls? What if he does this? What if he does that? But there was a little child that 
he believed in the faith that the tight wire walker had in himself. And he looks at him and he says, I'll do it. And so he crawls up on the man's shoulders and across they go and back. And the reason was because of the confidence that the child had in the confidence that the tight wire walker had in himself. Now, I know that's sort of a crude illustration, uh, but I think it illustrates the point anyway. We worship a great God. Uh, the confidence he has in himself to do what he says he can do is absolute. There's no element of doubt in the faith that God has in himself. If he says, I can raise the dead, guess what? It's absolute. He can raise the dead. Uh, now, do I believe in the faith that he has in himself? And the answer is, yes, I do. I do. That's how, that's where the doctrine of eternal security comes from, folks. It's God-centered. It's not man-centered. There's a vast difference. If you're trying to work up the faith to go to heaven, you're going to be working a long time. There are a lot of variables that can intervene. There are a lot of things that can cause doubts in your mind. Uh, I've often used the illustration of evil Knievel and his jumping, you know, uh, great spances uh, on a motorcycle. And the reason that people come to see Evil Knievel try to jump things with his motorcycle is because uh, just the intrigue of the element of doubt. The crowd comes and there's always this element of doubt. Will he make it? Will he make it? And that's the way it is with the faith of man. With the Listen to this. With the faith of man, there's always the element of doubt. There's always the element of doubt. Eternal security does not exist when the foundation of your knowing is the human mind. Can't be. The way you enter into the doctrine of eternal security is you have to get hold of the mind of God and you have to get hold of the faith that he has in himself. And it's absolute. It's absolute. Now, this is the tremendous advantage we have in reading the Bible and believing it. Because God has given us his mind. He's given us the faith that he has in himself. He says of himself, I'm a great king. There's no element of doubt with God. Everything is absolute with God. And he tells us that if we'll have faith and trust in him, he will give us everlasting life. Now, is that hope based on the understanding of an of a finite mind or is that hate, hope based on the promise of the infinite mind of God and I tell you it's based upon the infinite mind of God and so that's the difference between being man centered in your perspective of things and being God centered folks we need to learn to enjoy God centeredness we need to learn to think this way and, and, and be able to even explain to people who, who stumble over this kind of thing, the, the doctrine of, of eternal security. There are many churches who do not believe in the doctrine of eternal security, and it's because they've never really properly understood these kinds of thoughts, and that's the reason. It is impossible to enter into the doctrine of eternal security if you do not start from the God-centered perspective it is impossible to enter into it from the self-centered perspective. It's impossible. You can't do it. But this is the whole issue of the Bible, is helping us uh, get away from, escape from the problem of self-centeredness and the frailties of the human mind. We've got to get hold of the mind of God. We've got to be reconciled to Him. 
We've got to let that mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. That's where we've got to go. And so when it comes to such things as the problems of uh, the courts, with what we understand about the sovereign God, my hope for the future in this world is not going to be CLA. It's not going to be Attorney David Gibbs. I think that he's a, he's a precious gift that the Lord has given us to help us in the issues that we're dealing with. But folks, it's a big mistake to put your hopes in man. I don't care who he is. It's got to be in the true and living God. So, uh, in verse 34, Father, forgive them, uh, is, a, is a proffered um, is a proffered forgiveness based upon a certain free will response. In other words, just because the Lord said, Father, forgive them, doesn't mean that they all ended up forgiven. It does not mean that. There were not certain elect here that, you know, uh, he is speaking to, and so from the foundation of the world is now being pronounced upon them. Father, forgive them. As a matter of fact, if it was predestined before the foundation of the world, why did he even say the words? They were already forgiven. If they were predestinated that way, it just doesn't make sense. No, the issue is it was a proffered forgiveness based upon their willingness to, uh, in time, believe the truth concerning Jesus Christ and what he would do. And based upon their free will response to believe who he was and what he came to do, they could enter into this forgiveness. The thief on the cross that got saved entered into this uh, proffered forgiveness, and he was forgiven. The other thief did not, by an act of his own free will. He had just as much opportunity to be saved as the other man, but he chose not to be saved. In verse 34, it also says in the latter part, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. They parted his raiment and cast lots. Now, we're fixing to get into some thoughts here that will be an effort to discover the meaning of what is going on here. Don't forget now, at the beginning I told you that there are two ways you can read these scriptures. You can read it for the historical content only. So that if somebody ever asks you, what, well, what did they do at the cross of Calvary? Well, they, they took his garments and they parted his garments. Uh, they, they did that. They, they parted his, his garments and they cast lots for it. And that will be absolutely all that you know about it. It's just the historical record of an event, this is, the, this is what they did. But the question is, is that the only reason God inspired these words? Is so that we could have the historical record that they took his garments and they parted them and they cast lots for them? So what? What does that mean to me? Well, to tell you the truth, 2,000 years later, it means absolutely nothing to me. Now, I don't mean to sound uh, irreverent. But I think the point is, is obvious when you think about it. What does it mean to me, the historical record of anything that happened in the Bible? It doesn't do really anything for me. But now, if I enter into the meaning of what all of these events were, it becomes immensely important to me. Because it does have personal meaning that reaches down here to me some 2,000 years later if I can discern what, the, what that meaning was. Well, the only way we can get into that is study. We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. We've got to do that. We come here to these, these meetings, Sunday school and church services, and, 
And some people become really kind of discouraged about maybe services here because it's so teaching oriented. It's like going to school. That's hard. Thinking. That that's hard. People would rather be what's the word? Entertained. People would rather be entertained. Listen, in the flesh, I'd rather be entertained too. I like it when they say, We're gonna watch a um a film at the church tonight or whatever, the first thing, the natural response on my part is, oh, I'm going to get to do nothing. I'm going to just have to sit and just look and be entertained. Well, of course, that's a terrible attitude because actually the reason we show these things is so that it will provoke us to think. And we're either going to be entertained or we're going to think. We need to think. And we need to think about what these kinds of things mean here if we're going to go away out the door this afternoon with something we can carry with us that has personal meaning, that impacts our life, where we live, and our future. Now, I believe that all of these things that we're reading about here do that. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. What? does that mean? Okay, the way you begin to enter into this is you have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. <laughs> okay, this is why Sunday school takes so long. We have to start all over so many times at the beginning. Uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden? Well, you remember when Adam and Eve were created, they were naked. They didn't have raiment. And then they sinned and they became ashamed because sin is shameful. That's why, to use the illustration of little children, they, and adults, is they hide wrong acts. Why do they hide wrongful acts? Uh, because it's, it's a shame to do wrong. It's shameful. We don't want people to see what we're doing, so we hide our shame. What did Adam and Eve first do? They tried to hide their shame. They sowed fig leaves, so they tried to hide their shame. Sowing the fig leaves is no different than going behind a door and closing it so that mom and daddy can't see what's going on. Why? Because what they're doing back there would be shameful if it was discovered. Why are things done in the dark? So people can't see it because it would be shameful if it were known. Looking at pornography, why would people do that? Behind closed doors. Uh, because it would be a shame if other people knew it. Why do people sin, the sins that they sin, in dark places and behind closed doors because it would be a shame if the public knew. Okay, so the clothes is symbolism. It's symbolism up one side and down the other. It's symbolism. And if you do not enter into the meaning of symbolism as God uses it in Scripture, then you'll never really be able to enter into the real meaning of the events it's not enough, folks, to know that uh, Adam and Eve sowed fig leaves. You've got to understand what that meant. What, did, what, what, what does it mean? Well, it's a spiritual thing. Behind all these events, there is spiritual meaning. What is the spiritual meaning then? Well, the spiritual meaning is when you do wrong, uh, it's shameful. It's shameful. And with every wrong that any person ever does, there are embarrassing consequences because life doesn't turn out the way you thought it would when you committed the act of the sin. It doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. Well, it's kind of like stumbling and falling. You know, what do people do when they stumble? They immediately try to recover themselves and stand up and they look around to see if anybody saw it because it's a shameful kind of thing. 
Everybody knows that you're supposed to be upright, you're supposed to be sure-footed, and you're supposed to be able to walk and not fall. Now, with the little children, it's sometimes almost laughable. They'll walk along, and they're real short, and they stumble and fall. We pick them up and kind of smile, you know. But when an older person stumbles and falls, it's not funny at all. It's real serious. And it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to an adult. Uh, so is fornication. So is adultery. So is pornography. So is using a curse word when it's impulsive and spontaneous and somebody hears it. It's shameful. And so if we're going to understand the deeper meaning of these things, we've got to understand, first of all, that sin is a shame. It is a shame. You've got to understand that. So the question is, how do you cover the shame? They tried to do it by works of their own, Adam and Eve did. Well, it didn't succeed. It did not cover the shame. Folks, there's only one that can cover the shame of sin, and his name is Jesus Christ. How would he do it? Well, he symbolized it. He put it in type in what he actually did in the Garden of Eden. The Lord Jesus Christ was the first one to shed blood. He took the blood of a lamb. He killed the lamb, which required the shedding of blood. He took that dead animal and took the skin off of it, and he clothed Adam and Eve with it. That prefigured the cross of Calvary, where the Lord Jesus would die bloodshed his work his work on the cross when he said it was finished you remember Adam and Eve sowed fig leaves the Lord Jesus hung on the cross and he worked you know what he was working for he was making garments to cover our, sh our shame the garments of his righteousness we're talking spiritual talk here he would cover us with the garments of his rightness, his righteousness. Righteousness just simply means rightness. He would cover us in his rightness, in his righteousness, by the works of his own hands. He finished the work. He told his father as a child, wished ye not, his earthly father, wished ye not that I must be about my father's business. What was the business of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it was that of working out our redemption. He would provide salvation for us. He would do it himself. Salvation is of the Lord. So he went to Calvary's cross and he died there for us. And as a result of that death, he would cover us with the robes of his righteousness. Now, there is no way that you can begin to enter, in, enter into the significance of this language right here in verse 34, and they parted his raiment and cast lots, if you do not understand what you've just heard. There's no way you can enter into it. You have to go back to the beginning and study the significance of clothes and the clothes of the Lord Jesus and the symbolism related to clothes. And they parted, parted his raiment. Now, tied into this also is, uh, well, let's just mention this first of all. Um, this event is recorded in all four Gospels. So it's very important in the mind of God because it's repeated in all four Gospels. But I'd like for you to turn with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19 And let's look at some more particulars about this event. So we've got to get all these little particulars about this event uh, in our thoughts before we can really discover what's going on here. Verse 23 of John 19. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments. 
Now remember that the garments speak of his righteousness, his righteousness, that which can cover shame. They took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part. So there were four soldiers to every soldier a part. So there were four soldiers and four parts. So they divided his garments into four parts. Now the coat or robe over the part that was divided was woven from top throughout without seam. So they couldn't divide that without, you know, making it of no value whatsoever. Verse 24, They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. So now we've got all of these particulars. The question is, what does all of this mean? What does it really mean, spiritually speaking? Well, one thing that we know as a clue to the answer to the question is that garments speak of righteousness. It has to do with God providing a covering for this, the shame of sin. So we do understand that much of it. So, um, clothes symbolize righteousness in Scripture, at least those that God provides. Now, I'm going to go into something that, again, I, I hope to repeat some of this until it becomes a part of our way of thinking to the point that what appeared to be kind of complicated at the beginning is now really not that complicated. It's pretty simple. But I'm going to share with you some things that I learned from Dr. R.J. Rushdooney some years ago in a book he wrote called The One and the Many. I touched on this once before. But again, you cannot understand. I do not believe you can really understand this verse without understanding what Dr. Rushdooney was writing about when he wrote about the Dilemma of the one and the many. Now let me just tell you in a sort of a, uh, uh, a brief uh, description what, what this really involves. The one and the many is the problem of how to reconcile authority as we know it in the universe, the subject of authority. Uh, in other words, you have God, who is the ultimate authority of the universe. He's the one. He's the ultimate authority of the universe, and he represents the one, at least as we're going to apply it here. The many refers to those that are made in his image. The many. All of those that he made in his image have a free will. So you have what is called individuality. How do you reconcile the dilemma of the one and individuality, the many? How can they all be one? How can we all enter into the one so that we do not have conflict? Well you begin to be introduced to the dilemma of the one and the many in the Garden of Eden because you have the authority of the one who said, Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But then you have the many. You have Adam and Eve created in the image of God. God's original intent was that they be created like himself. And all throughout Scripture, he actually refers to man as gods. As gods. Because we're made in his image. In the Psalms, he said, uh, and he referred to it in the New Testament, did he not say that ye are gods? Then uh, how did David sin? 
in referring to Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, so he was sort of appealing to their understanding of what actually took place in the beginning when God created man in his image. Well, if God is God, if, if God is God and we're made in his image, then are we not gods? Well, I'll tell you one thing. That's the way most people behave is as though, as though they are gods and as though they are the ultimate authority in the universe, right? Isn't it true that even with our own children we experience this dilemma of the one and the many, the authority of the parent, and as they have children, getting the many that are made in our image, they're our offspring to agree with us, to enter into the authority of the one, but they have a free will. They have a free will. And this is the problem, the dilemma of the one and the many. How can you reconcile the one, the ultimate authority, with the free will of the many? And th this is the whole issue of the Bible, folks, up one side and down the other. Now, all of this has great bearing upon the significance and meaning of the parting of the garments and the casting of the lots for the seamless robe. Um, so that being said, let's try to let's try to look at it and see how all this fits together. Good grief! I don't know how in the world. By the time I set the stage for you know really getting into this, I really do not know how to uh, get into these subjects without taking the time to explain um, the, uh, the foundation to, uh, to, um, to actually understanding it. Folks, th this is not a comic book. We can't just look at it and, and flip the page and here we've got another scene and then flip the page. And so I think that what we're going to have to do is uh, is visit this subject for probably uh, at least two or three more Sundays until we can get hold of it. And then I believe one of these days I'll be able to meet you back here at the door and ask you uh, about the one and the many, and you'll be able to say, yeah, I know what that means. I know how that applies. And I know how that applies to the uh, the garments that were parted at the cross of Calvary and the robe, the seamless robe that they did not part. Uh, but the parting of the garments, I think, has in view the notion of the many because the soldiers looked at the garments, which is representative of the righteousness of God, and you know what they did with it? They parted it, and as they parted it, each of them was sitting there saying, well, I think I would like that part. I'll take that one. I'll take that piece. And there are four soldiers. And the other one says, okay, well, I'll take this one. And so they're each taking what they chose of the righteousness of God's garments, you know, which is symbolized there in the garments. Folks, that's what the world is doing today. They're looking at that part of God's righteousness and they're taking that to themselves as though you can do that. That's part of what, what is going on in the human race today. Uh, that's why we've got churches spread out all around the place. Each one of them is dividing the garment according to how they see fit and they're taking the part that they are in agreement with and that they like and they're leaving off the rest. They're parting the garments of Christ, dividing it up. And you've got denominations all over the place that are representative of this kind of thing. That's in part what's going on here. They're sitting here making decisions about what part of Christ's righteousness they would like to have. Now you know that uh, when you're dealing with the many 
perspective of it. In other words, the individuals that in the world with their free will, everyone is not going to want the same thing. They're not. They're going to take the part that they agree with, and that's exactly what the world is doing today. Um, so the question is, and this is the big issue of the Bible, how do you reconcile the will of man, the free will of man, with the mind of God, the mind of God? How do you do that? Well, we're going to see that the solution to this dilemma is the very cross of Christ itself, where the Lord Jesus would die there for us, uh, where we would agree that we have a problem and that our problem is the, the frailty and faultiness of our own mind. When we begin to realize that, then we're going to want more of the mind of God. We're going to want Him to teach us. That's why Paul said, let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're going to want more than this mind. We're going to want his life. We're going to want his life in exchange for our life. You know what happens when we do that? We give up our individuality of uh, trying to live life by our own powers of reason. We're acknowledging that we can't do it. We can't do it. And we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, we can't do it. We're not capable of life. We want your mind, which you say you've given us in your word, and we want your life, which you tell us in your word that you will give us in exchange for ours, and that you will die for our life on the cross. It will be put to death in yourself. And you'll give us in exchange for it your life as a free gift. This is the solution to the one and the many problem. The many agree with the one. The many become reconciled with heaven. And we come together as one. Heaven and earth is united and reconciled in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is accomplished by the cross of Calvary. Now... I've jumped ahead a little bit, but I wanted to at least say that much so that it, it would seem to sort of come together in our minds, the issue of the one and the many. And next week we'll take a look at the robe, the seamless robe, and we'll see what that symbolized because it symbolized something. You got the garments that were parted, and then you got the dilemma of, uh, well, what are we going to do with this? You can't part this. And so they cast lots for it. All right, what is the significance of that as far as the one and the many issue is concerned? We'll look at that next week. Our Father, we thank you for your precious word. Help us to um, understand these matters. And I know, Lord, at, at the moment this, this, is, uh, this is work, uh, thinking these issues through and, and growing to learn the meaning of these things. But it's all in the in the prospect of of uh, of, uh, of eventually understanding it, uh, so that we can see the significance of these things, and so that we might be able to appreciate the glory of your word. And I pray that this might take place for the honor and praise of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we make this prayer in his name. Amen.